Hi everyone, welcome to the third episode in my series on oil painting. We are going to dive right into this tutorial on how to sketch and then paint any female figure in any pose. I'll be mentioning how to make these tips work for every body shape, so let's just get started. So I'm not a professional figure or gesture sketcher. I really haven't been doing it for very long, maybe like a month or two, but there is an absolutely fantastic class on Skillshare that helped me just skyrocket into learning about figure. This video is not sponsored at all, <laughs> but I will link that class below and a link so you can get two weeks for free of Skillshare. Again, not sponsored. They didn't ask me to do this or anything. I just, it just helped me so, so much. Um, my video today is more surface level, but I hope it still helps you. So I'll be using two images to show the sketching steps, one standing, one sitting. So the first step I take to getting the proper shape of my figure is drawing what is called an action line. And this is just very light and sketchy and is just a way for you to look at the figure from a very high level view and just draw out the line that you see. Often a sketched figure will look less realistic because it's too stiff. So feel free to exaggerate it. A lot of gesture sketches are very exaggerated. And if you overcompensate, it'll come out looking right, if that makes sense. I redrew the action line several times since none of them were as dramatic as I wanted. And I do recommend that. Next is sketching movement. So you wanna sketch out little kind of sub action lines for each limb. And I do this to draw out the movement and the direction of the movement rather than the actual shape of the arms and legs. So the body is very curved and these curves become more pronounced in female bodies of higher weights. So you can modify this movement to kind of display the dominant side of the limb or the one that stands out to you the most. So in this case, the tops of the arms and the front of the legs stand out to me as dominant. So I make some kind of curvy arrows to show the movement. Um, this basically helps ensure the figure is posed as dramatically as you wish, and by keeping the lines light, you can always go back and fix them. Once you have those directions established, you want to sketch the tilt of the body. So again, feel free to dramatize this a bit. Um, when the body is tilted to one side, the shoulder line will tilt in the direction of that side, and the hip line will tilt in the opposite direction to make up for it. The hip line is usually not straight, so try and draw a line from the top of one direction line to the other. Now you can do the torso shape in general. So the pelvic area or the area just above the legs that kind of connects the tops of the legs can be generally represented by a circle. The circle will tilt either up or down or left or right depending on the angle of the hips and the line you drew. And the circle will be larger in heavier female bodies and smaller in those with a proportionally lower weight to their height. This is just a generalization. It depends on your reference, but the upper torso can be displayed with an oval or an ellipse, which will overlap with the circle we drew. And it will also tilt in the direction in which the body is leaning. So again, this ellipse will be wider for larger bodies and narrower for more narrow bodies. The torso line is something that completely helps with direction. It's one of my favorite parts. So you want to locate the V shape of the collarbone. So there's a little divot in the collarbone on figures and then the sternum. So I recommend starting this on bodies that are leaner. So the bones might show through more easily and you can see where the sternum is along with the bottom of the rib cage, it will help you grow accustomed to how these bodies are proportioned and where those different markers are located. So you can move on to bodies that the bones aren't showing through as much. Then depending on the subject's stomach size, I draw an S-shaped line from the rib cage base and I allow it to dip into the navel or the belly button area. I make that spot more pronounced and continue another inverted S-shape down to the base of the pelvis. This line immediately gives a three-dimensional look to the sketch, and it helps you visualize the figure as even more lifelike. Next, I moved on to the legs, um, but I actually usually do this step later. You'll see I go back and change the legs, but essentially the legs are composed on each side of two subsequent curved lines. They curve inward towards each other, kind of like the shape of a flying seagull. And this will vary a bit based on the pose, but you can look at your reference and decide where these curves are happening. There may even be multiple based on where the calves are, if they're protruding, as well as the knees. Now for my favorite part, 
Um, I'm not really sure why, but I love this part. It's accentuating the shape of the torso. So on the side on which the torso is contracting or the side that the subject is leaning towards, the skin will be folding over each other. So this is where the rolls of skin will appear, typically regardless of the subject size and weight. If the figure is heavier, then there may be more creases or maybe the creases will be larger. Now on the opposite side, which is extending, there will be a line that is tighter against the skin and stretched out between the bottom of the rib cage and the hip. So on average and lower weights, the shape will not usually have rolls of skin. It depends on your pose again, um, but instead it will have the skin tight, like I said, from the lower rib cage to the upper hip. Now on heavier bodies, there might be some overlapping skin or there may just be a curved line, which is set wider from the center of the torso than on a smaller body. Then I continue these darker lines up towards the muscles under the arms. Um, these I base on the image, so there isn't too much technique. It just took me a little practice to understand where the muscles were. I use curves to denote where there are larger muscles and there really aren't many straight lines on the body usually. Like the legs, the arms are composed of curved lines which curve underneath the arm from the armpit to the elbow joint and from the top of the arm, they curve inwards from the shoulder to the elbow and then again from the elbow to the wrist. There are additional little curves for the shoulder muscles which depend on the subject. These curves will be more dramatic in subjects of higher weight and there might be a little smaller bump to denote the, or the elbow joint. I don't go deep into hands and feet for this video, I can do that in another one if you'd like, but I am just going to use general rectangles to denote each of the groups of finger joints, or I guess they're more polygons. But again, I don't go much into that. For the chest, each side will be marked using a circle or oval shape. If the side is extended, the oval will be placed vertically, and if it is slumped or contracted, then the circle will be flatter or more horizontal. And then you can use smaller circles within which mirror the shape of the chest and their location varies depending on the reference. The neck is two inverted curves from the collarbone, which is formed from mirrored S shapes from the V that we created when drawing the center line. And again, I won't go too much into the head since it's really too complex to include in this, but it's essentially a circle and a triangle to form the chin with curved lines to help you depict the direction of the face. I, again, won't be painting it today, but you get the overall picture. Now I'm going to give you a quick demo using the same information we learned, but the subject is sitting. So this sketch includes the center line, directions of the limbs, shoulder and hip lines, torso shapes, waistlines, legs, center line, arms, and chest. Now, as I sketch out this figure, I want to explain lighting. It will vary based on your figure, but there are two types of shadows. There are cast shadows and form shadows. Form shadows are the areas of all light that are naturally blocked by a shape, which turns away light. Cast shadows are caused by one type of figure or form blocking light from getting to another form. So on the figure, these can be hard to identify, but essentially an example is that the shadow on a neck caused by the chin blocking the light source would be a cast shadow, a shadow cast, again, by an object onto another object. And a form shadow is the shadow I paint on the right side of the leg and hip, which is caused by the leg curving backwards away from the light and the light not reaching it. And the divot of the navel will create a cast shadow since one area of fatty tissue protrudes and blocks the light from reaching the opposite area of tissue. Recognizing these different types of shadows is important because not all shadows will be in deep contrast. They won't all be the same color. I am demonstrating this here where even though certain paint tones appear lighter when placed next to the deep contrast of the dark painted shadows on the figure's right side, I can use that same color to create a shadow on the left side of the body since it's more illuminated. So 
Therefore, because it's more illuminated, the shadows will also be lighter. And this is because the gentler curve of the abdomen and the breasts does not create any harsh shadows. If two areas appear to have some difference, but you cannot really tell if one is darker, consider adding some blue or gray to cool down the tone. So this way you can demonstrate that there is some type of curve or some type of difference in lighting without creating harsh shadows. For my reference, the areas I see in shadow with this harsh contrast lighting, besides the immediate and more obvious right sides of the body that are facing away from the lighting, include the collarbone, sternum, parts of the knee, around the breasts, the armpit, and arm muscles. As for lighting, just match the tones that you can find with your reference. Oftentimes, towards the end of a painting, if an area isn't contrasted enough, I'll add some pure white on top of it and blend it out into the surrounding wet paint. That's why I really like using oil paints because it's a lot easier to manipulate those shadows, in my opinion. So that was my demonstration. I really hope you enjoyed it. I was really excited to bring it to you and I hope it helped at least somebody out there. Be sure to subscribe and like this video if you did like it and comment down below your Instagram username so I can see if you use this. Also feel free to tag me on Instagram if you use this tutorial and I will see you next time. Bye.